Um, good evening. I'm Tim O'Shea, Principal of the University of Edinburgh. I would like you to give you <clears throat> the warmest of welcomes to the University uh, McEwen Hall for this second lecture in our Enlightenment lecture series sponsored by Scottish Power. This lecture follows the very successful and thought-provoking lecture given in February by Irene Khan, Secretary General of Amnesty International. The series aims to consider how Enlightenment as an ongoing process of social and cultural development continues to shape the times in which we live. We acknowledge the great debt owed to the scholars and philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment, individuals such as William Robertson, David Hume and Adam Smith, who challenged and changed the prevailing notions of the time. The series provides an opportunity for the people of modern Scotland to hear what world-leading politicians, philosophers, scientists and economists understand of enlightenment in the 21st century. There can be no doubt that our speaker this evening is of the world-leading category. Professor Joseph Stiglitz is one of the most influential and well-respected economists in the world. Born in Gary, Indiana in 1943, he studied first at Amherst College and then at MIT for his final year of undergraduate studies and later his PhD. He has held professorships at the universities of Yale, Stanford, Oxford and Princeton and he is now Professor of Economics and Finance at Columbia University in New York, uh, in New York City where he has taught since 2003 at the university's business school. He is also Chair of Columbia's Committee on Global Thought and Chair of the Management Board and Director of the Graduate Summer Programs at the Brooks World Poverty Institute hosted at the University of Manchester. Professor Stiglitz has made outstanding contributions both to economic policy and economic theory. From 1995 to 97, he chaired President Bill Clinton's Council of Economic Advisers. He then served from 97 to 2000 as Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank. In 2001, Professor Stiglitz was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information. He is widely credited with helping to define a new economic philosophy, a third way which recognizes the important but limited role of government which recognizes that unfettered markets often do not work well, but the governments are not always able to correct the limitations of markets. Professor Stiglitz is well known for questioning the reigning international economic policies and the institutions which govern them. In recent times, he has had a particular interest in issues relating to fair trade and globalization. His 2001 book, Globalization and its Discontents looks at the functions and powers of the main institutions that govern globalization, such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, and considers the impact their policies have had on the global economy. That book has been very influential and translated into 35 languages. He has just published a new book, Making Globalization Work, which looks at the changes to the global economy in recent years and considers how we might deal with the problems of our age, including addressing the crippling debts of developing countries. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome Professor Joseph Sticklitz to the stage to address us this evening on the subject of the Scottish Enlightenment and globalization. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about this important subject. Actually, the subject of, of the Enlightenment has been a subject of uh, increasing concern, interest in the United States, because there are increasing worries about retrogression, that the values, the mentality, the sense of tolerance, that symbolized that, uh, that was so important in the Enlightenment are being lost, at least by some people, 
within the United States. And it will be an important challenge, I think, to try to bring back these values, the concern about rationality, science, moral, morals, back into the United States and into our government. The writers of the Enlightenment have left, I believe, an indelible impression on humanity uh, that we all need to take into account. The subject of my talk today, however, is a little bit less political, or maybe more political, uh, but more, somewhat more narrower. It's globalization and the Enlightenment. And one, one might think that, you know, what is the connection between these two quite different ideas, a set of philosophical ideas almost uh, more than 200 years ago, uh, on the one hand, and a political and economic movement, globalization, that has come to the fore so strongly within the last 15 years. But there are actually a large number of connections. The first is uh, the fact that uh, even 200 years ago, the precursors of modern globalization were having a very large impact here in Scotland. Uh, I just spent a, a little time in, in uh, Adam Smith's library here in the library, and uh, what what is very clear uh, is that he was influenced a great deal by ideas coming from outside, and that's true of many of the other writers of the Enlightenment. Ideas moved across borders then perhaps not quite as much as they do today, but clearly ideas moved across the world uh, of that time. But perhaps even more important was the fact that this was, uh, relative to the, what had happened in the centuries before, there was an enormous opening up of the world. The colonies were being established, the colonies were challenging the home country, and there were enormous uh, challenges of coming to terms with what was going on, with issues of colonialism, slave trade, uh, even the issues of privatization of government. And in many ways, what is remarkable is how many of the issues that people like Adam Smith and Stewart faced at that time, or Hume, are not dissimilar to the issues that are faced today, uh, policy issues that they faced were similar to some of those that we face today. And even the nature of the debate that they engaged in have remarkable similarities. For instance, consider one issue, the issue of trade, international trade. On the one side, there was an argument for government intervention. On the other, uh, arguments that Smith put forward for free trade. There are arguments including by others here in, 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 in Scotland, and as part of the Scottish Enlightenment of Stuart, that argued that for the infant industry argument, the fact that the development of uh, industries in less developed countries, and parts of Scotland were then viewed as less developed, uh, that and they were concerned with the highlands and, and uh, 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 that, that in order for these less developed parts to develop, there might have to be active government policies. So that the notions of laissez-faire that have been become associated with Smith, in fact, were questioned. Uh, and even if you read, read Smith more carefully and, and look at what some of the arguments that he put forward, he put forward and uh, identified what we would, in modern language, call it an externality, a link, uh, a recognition that the development of the cities would have impacts on the less developed parts of the country, uh, would have a, an impact on the rural sector. Uh, I was particularly attracted to that idea because I recently published a paper which I called the infant economy argument, which I, uh, uh, realize now that uh, Adam Smith an anticipated. 
And um, in this world of academics, you often have to look for for uh, an ancient, uh, you might not, you'll say whether he, he led you to have the idea, it gives it authenticity that somebody 200 years ago really understood these, this idea. Well, the idea that, that uh, development doesn't happen automatically, that one has to have government policies to promote it, um, is an idea that I'm going to come back to in a few minutes. Of course, the language and some of the, the, the models they used were, were markedly different. Uh, Smith hadn't quite developed the theory of information asymmetries. Um, perhaps if he had, I would not have gotten the Nobel Prize in that. But about two decades ago, after I did my work in information asymmetries, I, I was curious whether Smith had anticipated this idea and whether one, by pouring through this stuff, one could find some, some inklings of an idea that, that reflected an awareness of the fact of, of what we would today call the problems of adverse selection or moral hazard. And in fact, in Smith's writing, one can see these ideas very clearly articulated. Since then, they got lost in, the, in what happened. I'll come back to that in a second. But clearly, Smith was far more aware of these market imperfections than many of his followers. While he was aware of some of the market imperfections, of course, he was also aware and very concerned about the limitations of the government. And these, unfortunately, played out a lot in what happened in the subsequent uh, uh, period. Um, after it was, it was Smith's emphasis on the limitations of government that got so much attention uh, in the years later. The focus of my remarks uh, this afternoon, though, is rather different. It's not on the view that, that the issues of globalization in, the, in that particular period had enormous influence in the development of their ideas, but rather I want to talk about how the ideas of the Enlightenment, how the values of the Enlightenment, help us to think about the problems posed today by globalization. Ideas like tolerance, moral values, rationality, pragmatism, that we've come to associate so, so closely with, with the Scottish Enlightenment. The confrontation of, of in, of different societies that modern globalization has resulted in, the fact that, that people of very different cultures have come face to face, that there are these encounters, a result of increased migration, mobility, uh, as I say, the globalization of the world, forces us to think, to address the problems of how we deal with people who are, whose worldview often differs markedly from our own. And here, I think, the Enlightenment values of tolerance become absolutely necessary. They are necessary if we are to live together, hopefully in harmony, if not, at least without intolerable conflict. It forces us to think carefully about the role of the state. For instance, in forming and uh, establishing standards by which all countries or all individuals to which all individuals have to conform. Uh, and what, to what extent do we force people who have ways of living that are different from our own conform to those of our own? Uh, what is clear is that there are a core set of values of of beliefs, a core set of, of regulations that we do need to agree to if we are to live together as a global community. Uh, and internationally, we are, have been engaged for the last 60 years of trying to establish what those core standards are. Uh, we cannot live together if we don't believe, for instance, in a certain set of basic human rights. And that was why it was so important to have the human, uh, the, the Declaration of, of Human Rights. Core labor standards, which the International Labor Organization has helped establish. A rule of law. Uh, conventions, which have been agreed to by all the countries of the world about uh, the treatment of children, 
about torture. Uh, these really help define what we mean by civilization, and these, I think, define the basic minimum of the rules, the regulations, the, the framework that we have to agree, to which we have to agree if we are going to live together as a global community. The problem is that too often there's an attempt on the one hand to go beyond these particular narrow confines, and on the other hand, there's too often a tendency to try to ignore these basic values in areas where it's absolutely essential that they have to be uh, obeyed. In the second category, for instance, President Bush's rejection of torture, uh, a rejection of the convention of, effective rejection of the convention of torture is an example of trying to undermine the international rule of law and the international convention about how we treat each other and has an absolutely enervating effect on the way we as society, as a global society, live together. Uh, it's not just a question of the treatment of the prisoners of war under the Geneva Con Convention, but it's the convention of torture which, for which there is no exception uh, that is being abrogated by the Bush administration. While the Bush administration is not living up to what I view as the basic standards that form a core basis of civilization, there is an attempt to go beyond that enforcing standards, market economy standards, I'll come back to that, uh, like intellectual property, that are, are not necessary for us as a global community to live together. In fact, make it more difficult uh, the view that I've been very critical of the IMF in trying to impose a one-size-fits-all is another example of trying to impose a common standard of what is good economics on all countries of the world. So the notion that I'm trying to put forward is that there are some basic standards and that too often, unfortunately, we have not been living up to those. But on the other hand, that the notions of tolerance must lead us, lead us to a view uh, that uh, we have to allow in a large variety of areas different economic systems, different ways of conducting uh, the economy and society. The second major concern I have is that the rules that have been set up, uh, the rules of the game, the the uh, that 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 have been that international institutions have tried to foist and impose on too many of the developing countries, are not based on the sex of values that we have come to associate with the Enlightenment. Values, as I say, like rationality, pragmatism, moral values. I think Adam Smith would have, uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is that, that uh, Adam Smith, while he, uh, he was, uh, uh, would have rejected this kind of uh, ideology, blind faith, in fact, which, which was at the rejection of the ideology and blind faith was at the heart of the Enlightenment, it, it was a, uh, uh, an unfortunate consequence that he himself unintentionally became the father of a new religion, the god of a new religion, of a new ideology, which was the free market ideology. Uh, an ideology which his ideas helped play such a large role in establishing, but anybody who has read his works would realize that he himself would probably be turning over in his grave uh, if he recognized what was being done in, in his name. And I want to spend the next few minutes talking about some examples of, of what I mean by this. Uh, and the first issue I want to talk about is, is the broader moral issue. Obviously, Smith and, and most of the other writers of the Enlightenment were very concerned with moral issues. Uh, Smith was a professor of moral philosophy. 
It was a concern with which they have, were preoccupied. And yet, in a way, Smith's argument formed the basis of letting people not think about moral issues. His argument that, as ex commonly interpreted, was that individuals, by the pursuit of their self-interest, are led as if by an invisible hand uh, to the general well-being. And economists, after 200 years, have found out exactly what that means, the conditions under which it's true. It's been one of the major uh, uh, issues with which economic science has been concerned. Well, if that result were true, it would mean that the only immoral thing to do would be not to follow your self-interest. So the only accusation of being immoral is that you weren't selfish enough. Because if you were selfish, you would be pursuing the well-being of society as a whole. And that makes life very easy. The CEOs that stole all that money for their companies during the 1990s could look at themselves and say, look, I was just doing what Adam Smith told me to. I was just pursuing my self-interest, and I know this self-interest leads to the well-being of society. And what would you have me do? Anything different? And they actually constructed a, a, they actually felt good about themselves. I mean, I talked to a lot of them, and they feel that they were bringing enormous benefits of which uh, they were working hard to get a system that led them to work even harder. After all, you know, if you're firing uh, lots of workers, you need a lot of pay. You need to get $100 million to compensate you for the pain of firing people. So, uh, and then after all, after you pay yourself $100 million, you have to fire them because the company has no money. <laughs> so this is the moral system that is now attributed to Adam Smith. Of course, economic science in the last uh, 50 years has made it clear that often uh, it is not the case uh, that the uh, market, the pursuit of self-interest, automatically leads uh, to uh, economic efficiency, well-being, general well-being. In fact, one of the results uh, that my own work, focusing on imperfect information, showed that whenever there is imperfect information or imperfect risk markets, which is always, then the reason that the invisible hand often seems invisible is that it's not there. <laughs> that is, that the pursuit of self-interest does not lead to economic efficiency. And the good news is that it provides now an argument for why people ought to think once again about what is moral. That if you steal, if you, if you do what a lot of these executives did, design this executive compensation packages that were designed in the way, you are not engaged in what might be called a moral activity. Internationally, when companies go into uh, developing countries and devastate their environment, bribe government officials, take out their natural resources, not paying them fair market value, it may have the result of increasing their stock market value. And those who say that's, the, that's what firms should do, after all, it increases their profits, the higher the profits, the higher stock market value, and that is what we teach them in business school they're supposed to do. But again, I would argue that that is not moral, and increasingly companies are realizing that it may not even be in their long-run interest, and there's an important movement called business social responsibility. So the first point I want to raise is that, that there are a set of moral issues which modern economics have restored to economics, but unfortunately too often the advocates of simplistic market economics have forgotten about. What makes it even worse is that too often this ideology that I talked about, sometimes called market fundamentalism, the version of this that is pushed on developing countries is more extreme than that which has been adopted by any developing countries. That within most developed countries, the notions of pragmatism, notions of the fact that we have democracies, have succeeded in tempering the market economy. In the 19th century, 18th century, 
uh, the Industrial Revolution had some very negative effects uh, on, on people, particularly in working classes, all over the world. Uh, we, we see data where uh, life expectancy was reduced, hikes were reduced. We can look at medical records and see that actually living standards in much of the, among large fractions of the population actually went down. But eventually we passed legislation about working conditions and eventually uh, uh, we circumscribed some of the worst kinds of behavior. We eventually, in the 20th, 20th century, we put regulations that uh, re imposed better environmental conditions. And so some of the damage was reversed and that we have made the market economy work in ways that the benefits of it are at least far more widely shared than they were 100 years ago. The problem is twofold. One, that, on, that the IMF and, and the internet ideology that has been foisted on the developing countries has been pushing a version of the market economy that is more extreme than we will find anywhere. For instance, uh, at the period uh, when, uh, even when the period when I was in the Clinton administration, uh, the, uh, while the Clinton administration was fighting very hard to make sure that there was access to health for everybody and that uh, there was uh, within the United States and while they were fighting uh, very hard uh, to make sure that the social security system which had been so effective in reducing poverty among the aged in the United States was kept internationally the IMF was pushing privatization of Social Security. It was pushing, uh, the, the United States was actually pushing within the WTO to reduce access to life-saving medicines. I'll come back to that in a minute. And the IMF, while the United States was very much aware of the importance of uh, a monetary policy that focused on, not just on inflation, but on employment and on growth, there was one of the senators in the United States who tried to change the charter of the Federal Reserve to focus just on inflation. The president said, we'll, we'll go to the American people, we'll ask them, do they care about jobs or not? And as soon as he said that, uh, the response was, yes, uh, we didn't really mean to change the, uh, that was just a, a, an idea that somebody had. But meanwhile, uh, at the IMF, uh, it was pushing country after country to change their Federal, their, their central bank's mission to focus just on inflation. And here in Europe, you have a European central bank that went along with this movement of having a central bank that focuses just on inflation at an enormous cost to employment. So what has happened is that rather than having an economic policy that was based on rationality, on trying to understand really what makes a market economy work that under, based on, on a broader sense of moral values, what was pushed was an ideology, a new religion. I saw that so clearly, for instance, when I watched what the IMF tried to do in 1997, when it tried to change the regulations, uh, tried to uh, push this idea of capital market liberalization. That's opening up markets to the free flow of uh, speculative capital across boundaries. You can't build factories on money that can go in and out of a country overnight. When the IMF started to try to push this, I asked, I was at the time chief economist of the World Bank, I asked, where is there evidence that this is going to help developing countries grow? the World Bank, we had done some research which showed that it was bad for economic stability. And we had done some preliminary work that showed that it wasn't good for economic growth. And so we asked the IMF, where is your evidence before you make this fundamental change that it would bring benefits to the developing countries and bring benefits to most of the people in these developing countries? And the response was, you know, they have a large research group. They had done no research on this. Why? Because they didn't need to have evidence. They knew it was true. It was a religion. Free markets are better than unfree markets, and who can be against freedom? 
unliberalization. All they wanted is to free up capital markets. So it was about freedom. And so in this particular perspective, it was a really, uh, it was nothing more than a religious doctrine. Interestingly, uh, after uh, I and others had pushed very hard on this, finally the, the chief economist of the IMF finally in 2003 did a study and they came up with the only answer that they could come up with, which was capital market liberalization wasn't as good as they had thought. Meanwhile, there had been enormous damage. Uh, a lot of countries had a crisis, but then they finally came up with the right answer, and at least uh, it seemed to suggest they were going in the right direction. But even then, they said economic theory could not explain why it wasn't having the benefits that it was supposed to have. But again, it was a, a, almost a religious mindset. Well, their theory, economic theory, but their economic theory was based on perfect information, perfect markets. But in developing countries, in fact, in developed countries, there is not perfect information, there are not perfect markets, and the kinds of theories of imperfect information had explained why it was that quite often opening up markets to these speculative capital flows can be destabilizing. Interestingly, a lot of these ideas, uh, this was an ideology which in some ways seemed to serve a particular group. It seemed to serve the interest of financial markets. But because they didn't really understand the underlying economics, the policies which they pushed led to such instability that actually many people in the financial markets were hurt. So it was an interesting example. While the ideology may have been, they may have been a comfortable ideology because it helped promote their self-interest. The ideology worked that, together. In fact, because they hadn't done the careful thinking that they should have done, or because they hadn't had the pragmatic approach that they should have had, it actually did not always serve their interest. Uh, there are other examples, but I, I, I want to go on and have some time for, for questions. Um, but the other example I was going to talk about was the, this issue of the, the infant industry argument, um, where, again, the ideology was very strong. Opening up markets, free markets, would lead to economic growth. Trade liberalization would lead to economic growth. Well, if you look at it carefully, Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Haiti took away all its tariffs. Haiti has not done very well economically. There are lots of other reasons for the problems of Haiti. But the point was, if you look across all the countries in the world, there has been no relationship between economic liberalization, trade liberalization, and economic growth. The reason is that in many cases, what's happened is that when you liberalize, you lose jobs. Many of the poor countries of the world have high unemployment. The theory was that liberalization was supposed to allow people to move from unproductive, protected sectors into more productive export sectors. But if the economy isn't working well, if you don't have good capital markets, if you can't borrow money to start new enterprises, what happens is that when you take away the tariffs, people move from low productivity protected sectors into unemployment. So you get more poor people, more unemployment, and you don't get more growth. So the lesson of this is that liberalization can work, but it has to be accompanied by other policies. And too often what happened to the ideology, people who believe in the ideology, is they just assumed that the supply of labor would create its own demand. And they assumed you throw people out of the jobs and there will all of a sudden be a demand for that job. We know it's not true. We've known it for 75 years. Unfortunately, people who believe in this religion wouldn't look at the reality of what was going on. The issue of looking at these issues, of looking at the questions from the point of view of self-interest, I already discussed that how that doesn't work 
in general when there's imperfect information in leading to economic efficiency. But there's a more fundamental problem when it comes to writing down the rules of the game. The question is, what should be the rules that guide international trade? What should be the rules that guide, uh, that, that guide uh, international financial markets? And in answering that rule, that, those questions, one can't be guided by self-interest. Uh, one has to be guided by principles of moral values. And again, even Smith recognized that. He talked, for instance, about the proclivity of businessmen, tradesmen, when they get together, to try to create monopolies. Well, it's in the self-interest of monopolies to maintain their monopoly power. You can't ask a monopolist, you can't ask Bill Gates, do you think a monopoly is a good thing? His answer is self-interest says, yes, it's a good thing. It maxes my, my profit. Look at how well I've done. But it doesn't maximize the well-being of society as a whole. And unfortunately, one of the problems in the rules of the game as they've been set is that the advanced industrial countries have been following the idea that let's have rules that pursue our self-interest at the expense of the developing countries. And the most dramatic example of that perhaps, or at least one dramatic, is, is related to intellectual property, which has been so important in maintaining some of these global monopolies. Everybody recognizes the importance of intellectual property in pro providing incentives for innovation. You know, I, I've just written a book. Uh, my publisher would certainly not be interested in the fact uh, if, if anybody could just steal it. Uh, I might, you know, not be so worried as long as he gave me uh, his advance and uh, so long I would actually uh, like it if the ideas got widely disseminated. Uh, the uh, a number of years ago, about 20 years ago, I got a letter from uh, a Chinese uh, publisher who wanted to uh, me to write a forward to a pirated uh, a version, uh, a Chinese pirated version of my textbook. And I was, <laughs> I was quite enthusiastic. I thought, you know, even if not all billion people in China read the book, um, if even uh, a small fraction of that, you know, I've already written the book, it doesn't cost me, it's not going to affect my incentives at all. Uh, I'd rather have the ideas disseminated, but my publisher was very, very unhappy about this, uh, <laughs> this idea. But that illustrates, the story I've just said, illustrates the fact, the conflict that we have, a conflict between the fact that knowledge is a public good. There's enormous value of disseminating knowledge. The whole university is based on this uh, view that we want ideas to get out, uh, that the free flow of ideas. Uh, and, and, and economists talk about this in a technical term. They say knowledge is a, is a public good. And restricting the use of a public good is a bad. Uh, it is an inefficiency. It leads to an economic inefficiency. So in a way, we are always facing this, you might call it pragmatic trade-off between dynamic incentives, incentives to engage in innovation, but the inefficiency of not allowing the ideas to be used as widely as they could. Unfortunately, the intellectual property regime that was included in the last round of trade, of trade discussions and uh, the Uruguay round that was completed in 1994 did not represent the right balance. I was again in the Council of Economic Advisors at the time, and both we and the Office of Science and Technology Policy opposed the intellectual property provision that's in the Uruguay round. We said it was bad for American science, it was bad for global science, and it was bad for the developing countries. It was bad both for their development and even more important, for a moral issue, for their right to life. because. One of the areas that is extremely important, where access to knowledge is important, is access to life-saving medicines. So when the trade ministers in April 15, 1994, signed in Marrakesh the Uruguay Round, they were, in effect, condemning to death hundreds of thousands of people in sub-Saharan Africa and other developing countries. 
drugs that were affordable before that were no longer affordable. And you might say, well, there was a trade-off. If they didn't have intellectual property rights, the drugs, the medicines wouldn't be there. But that's simply wrong. The fact of it is that the drug companies are not doing any significant research on the diseases of the developing countries. They spend more on marketing than they do on research. They spend more on research on lifestyle drugs, like hair and other things, than they do on life-saving drugs. They spend, of the amount they spend on life-saving drugs, essentially none goes to the diseases concerning developing countries. So that's a case where the way the international regime has been played out has not been balanced. Uh, it has been not based on rational principles, not been based on pragmatism, and not been based on moral values. Well, I better conclude because I, I'm a, I, I have some more things I wanted to talk about, but I, 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 I want to have a chance for, for questions. So let me just conclude that by saying that looking at globalization from the perspectives of the Enlightenment, thinking about how these great moral philosophers and social scientists would have tried to come to terms with the issues, the important policy issues that globalization confronts society, global society today, I think is very instructive. And I think if we follow, if we try to think about how they would have approached it, I think we will wind up with a form of globalization which is far better than the kinds of globalization that we've been having. Smith was right in seeing the powerful forces of markets. And like so many that claim to be his followers, he realized the limits of markets. In our democracies, we have learned how to make markets work. We have seen the benefits of well-functioning markets be shared more widely. With the perspectives of tolerance, pragmatism, and a concern for moral values, social justice, we can learn from the Scottish Enlightenment, we can make globalization work, so the potential benefits which globalization can bring will be enjoyed not just by the rich in the well-off countries, but by the vast majority of citizens in all the countries, rich and poor. Thank you. That was really excellent. Um, so now Professor Stiglitz has agreed to take questions. If you would like uh, to pose a question, please indicate and a microphone should come to you. Looking for the microphones. Could you bring the microphone to the questioner? Could you be so kind as to introduce yourself and keep the question short? Professor Stiglitz, Hugh Kerr, uh, represented today Red Pepper magazine. But I have a confession to make as a former <clears throat> member of the European Parliament, I once voted to ratify the WTO. And I guess my question to you is, after listening to you and your critique of the international institutions, is did I make a mistake? Because we argued then, I recall, that all the things that you said that international institutions need, the uh, abolition of child labor, labor rights, and so on, were not present in the WTO. And indeed, China has been admitted to it, despite the fact that trade union rights are not respected, that they're occupying Tibet, that uh, you know, the human rights are not uh, respected in China. So I guess my question is, are these international institutions, which you have been a part of, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, actually reformable through a system of global governance? Or maybe we just need to abolish them all and start again. Maybe the problem is that actually capitalism is immoral. Okay. I, I actually think that uh, maybe I, I'm an inveterate optimist, uh, and I think that they are, are reformable. And there's one more important point uh, to raise, that the WTO did one important, uh, the Uruguay Round had one important provision, that it began, the, it was the beginnings of an international rule of law in trade. 
And that itself is very important. And the, the reason it's important it can be you know, brought up in the absence of a rule of law, the powerful dictates to every, any other country. Since then, the United States, uh, for instance, has been brought up to the WTO for imposing steel tariffs, and it lost. It was brought up uh, for a uh, uh, particular provision it has with respect to dumping and lost, uh, export subsidies against Europe and lost, and most importantly, in the context of the development round, which is clearly not is almost surely dead, one of the big issues in, in, in the development round was agriculture and America's refusal and, and Europe's to do anything about uh, their subsidies. But actually, what made the whole, whole debate a little bit surrealistic was that Brazil had already brought a case against the United States for the cotton subsidies. And the WTO ruled against the United States. So the cotton subsidies will almost surely disappear, not through negotiation, but because of this international rule of law. Now, in one of the chapters of my book, I argue that this international rule of law can be used to force the United States to conform with the principles of global warming in the Kyoto. Uh, there was a very important case that uh, the United States brought without fully thinking through the consequences. Uh, it was called the uh, Thai shrimp turtle case. The United States said that uh, the, the, the uh, shrimp from Thailand were being caught in nets that were turtle unfriendly and hurting endangered, uh, a species of endangered, uh, 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 tur uh, endangered species of turtle. And the United States said we will not import shrimp from turtle that are caught in shrimp from Thailand that are caught in, this, uh, in these nets. And the WTO sustained that. Now, one of the clear implications is that the, the United States has been engaged in producing all variety of goods using production technologies that are unfriendly to our atmosphere. That the United States is the largest polluter. The consequences is enormous. It is doing damage. You know, a third of Bangladesh will be underwater. Maldives will be underwater. Our own 21st century uh, uh, Atlantis. Uh, and yet, the United States continues to go ahead engaging in this damage. Well, it's an unfair trade act. And I've actually talked to one of the people that was in the appellate uh, panel, and they were even aware of the, some of the implications. So what I w would argue is, yes, everything has its ups and downs, but this particular beginnings of the rule of law, which I think is very important, can be used if there's pressure from civil society to help make a fair globalization and one which, which allows us to advance certain other uh, goals like a, 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 an environment that we can live with. Very good. There's a question there. You can pass the microphone along. I am a layperson with an interest in economics. Um, is there a direct relationship between the current rigid application of free market ideology and the rather repugnant concept of the failed country or the failed state? Yes. Uh, the question, in case you didn't hear, is, is there a, a, a relationship between uh, the f free market ideology, which I describe as being pushed, and a concern increasingly about the failed state? Uh, and, the, and, and the answer is yes, that in a way, for a while the ideology was very much markets solve everything. And if you believe that markets solve everything, you don't need a government. And unfortunately, they took this ideology too seriously, circumscribed what the government did, didn't worry about undermining the government. One of the things that the international institutions did when they provided money, they put all kinds of conditions. Those conditions effectively undermined democracy because it said, we will determine what your government does, not your citizens. So they help weaken the democracies within these countries. 
And it is not surprising that today we recognize that a, in a very large fraction of the countries, the problem isn't too much government, it's too weak government, it's a failed state that can't provide the bare necessities of what it means for a civilized society to, to live together. Okay, next question, there's a lady at the front here. Uh, hello, I'm Antonia Swinson, business writer and, sorry, <clears throat> bad throat, chief executive of the Scottish Social Enterprise Coalition. I'd like to ask Professor Stiglitz on his opinion on the potential and future power of the non-profit business sector. Um, earlier this year, I attended the sort of Skoll World Forum on Social Entrepreneurship, and uh, Jeff Skoll said that, in fact, the non-profit sector, social enterprise, could actually begin to take on, in time, business in terms of research and development for uh, medical cures in developing world, in microcredit, the growth of microcredit, not just for small businesses, bigger businesses. And indeed, um, one of the speakers there was a, um, was a social entrepreneur from Latin America who'd set up a social enterprise stock exchange. I'd like your opinion sure. on, on the potential of this sector. Yeah. One, one of the criticisms, I think, of, of, the, of, of the set of ideas that uh, of the Washington consensus uh, and the market fundamentalism that I described before was that it divided the world into two institutions, markets, profit-making firms on the one hand, and government markets and profit-making organizations, in case you didn't understand from what I already said, are good and governments are bad. So that was this very simplistic ideology. But in fact, there are a very large third sector that has a, a whole variety of different forms, uh, NGOs, civil society, co-op, cooperatives, that Anybody who's understood the market economy, or understand the evolution of, of a successful economy, has realized that these institutions have long played a very important role in many parts of many societies. Uh, I, I teach at Columbia. It's a private university. It's not a profit-making university. It's, it's a non-profit. Uh, in the United States, the most important uh, company uh, companies. The, the most important, uh, largest producer of butter is a co-op. Um, and a co-ops have played a very important role in, in the rural sector in a large number of sectors, orange, oranges, raisins, um, and also in providing credit. Uh, most of the buildings in New York City are, uh, are, are cooperatives. So, Cooperatives are a viable, very strong set of alternatives. In developing countries, they are particularly important. And some very interesting research has been done in India, where there are parts of India where the sugar mills have been owned cooperatively, and other parts where the sugar mills have been owned by a monopolist. By, by, by. And th those parts where it's been cooperatively have grown, have done much, much better. So the answer, the, the, the broad answer is yes, the cooperatives have a very important role. The big revolution in Bangladesh, the Grameen Bank, uh, BRAC, uh, microcredit was all done by these NGOs, but they're not small like they are in many countries. They are involving, each of these organizations involve five million individuals and are having macroeconomic effects. Uh, and, and, and the, they have been successful, I think, because they lie in this third area. The government's not being very effective, and the criticism of the government there are very valid. But the private sector has also not worked very well, and they've come in and filled the gap. It's not a panacea, however. It doesn't work everywhere, and, and, uh, but I, I do think uh, it has a larger role to play than it has often been given credit for. And there's a question there. Tom 
Thomas Bach from the University of Edinburgh here. Um, I was wondering to what extent do you think globalization is above all Western ideas being expanded, transferred to all parts of the world, or are there any non-European or kind of non-Western traditions that you think could be very valuable and the West could learn from? Yeah. Uh, that all, it's a really good question. It's a, it's a very important question because it's, it's part really of, of the debate about globalization. And there are two parts of that question I want to, I want to take up. Uh, the first part is that, uh, in fact, one of the big controversies during the East Asia crisis was that the view in Asia that the IMF and the U.S. Treasury did not really understand the Asian economies. And they didn't understand many aspects of Asian society. So that, for instance, they had better, stronger social protections in some of these countries. They had better job guarantees than America particularly has. And, uh, and, and they were being told, you have to give up your system. Your system clearly is not working. Look at the crisis. And uh, that was one of the big sources of resentment, a, a, a sense that, that these guys, uh, that, that they were uh, being, that an a economic system that was not theirs, they had evolved their own Asian model which was enormously successful. Remember, for 25 years, 30 years, these countries grew at a rate of 5, 6, 7, 8 percent. China's grown at 30 percent for 9 points, uh, grown at 9.7 percent for 30 years. So these are, 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 are unprecedented growth. So their view is, look, we've been enormously successful. With our model, which is markedly different from the market fundamentalist model, and how can you come and then tell us what to do? In fact, I was in, uh, not very long ago, I was in one of the crisis countries where the prime minister described himself. He says, we were, we were in the class of 97. We learned the hard way. Their view was the reason that they had a crisis was that they had listened to the IMF, had done this capital market liberalization, and their view was never again would they do that. They have, one of the chapters in my book is devoted to one of the consequences of that is they've accumulated an enormous amount of reserves so that they wouldn't have these alternative views projected on them, foisted on them, that they would have more, more independence to pursue their own economic model. What is important to realize that even within Europe there are many economic models. There's the Anglo-American model. But Scandinavia has a very different model as well. So sometimes we, uh, I think, oversimplify and say there is a Western model. There are actually many models. Scandinavia has very high tax rates. But it has grown just as fast and has just as much of a new economy as any of the advanced, any of the other countries. In fact, in terms of what I would say is a more relevant metric of success, People always say, look at U.S. It's growing very rapidly relative to much of Europe. But that growth is all about GDP. It doesn't ask, how does the representative American, what's happening to the typical American? The median American household income today is lower than it was five years ago. We've had no growth. Bill Gates is better off. A few other people at the top are better off. But the median, the person in the middle, is worse off than he was five years ago. And what has happened in the United States over the last 30 years, at the bottom is even worse. The people, the real wages at the bottom 20 percent are down by about 30 percent over 30 years. So it's just not, not just that there's stagnation. The people at the bottom, in terms of real wages, are getting worse off. They're making up for it a little bit by working longer and having a very negative effect on family life. But, but in terms of the most important metric, real wages, it's going down. So the answer in, in some ways is that there are many forms of capitalism, not just Asian, but also within Europe. 
and that we, we should recognize, and one of the problems is we've tried to push one particular version on developing countries. The other issue that I just want to just mention very, very, very briefly, which again I talk about in my book, is that one of the concerns about globalization is that it has not paid attention to the cultures of different countries. And cultures are very important in not only a sense of identity, uh, uh, in, in even in terms of economic development, maintaining the social fabric. Uh, in a way, if you, one, of the, one of the important uh, aspects of the people in the Enlightenment was they had a, well, they had a culture that was developing all these ideas. And, and I think one of the things, all of a sudden, the United States Volcker raised the interest rates to levels that had never been. They went up to 20 percent. It had been at 5, 6, 7 percent, and all of a sudden they were up at 20 percent. Well, the countries could manage it when they were at 5, 6, 7, 8 percent, but they couldn't manage the decks at 20 percent. And they had to bear the risk of interest rate fluctuations. That's not the way markets, well-functioning markets should work. The rich should be bearing the risk, but we make the poor bear the risk. So Latin America went through a crisis. One country after another defaulted on their debt. There was no restructuring, no system of dealing with, with the problem of, of debt. We used to have a system in the 19th century. British and French armies would go in and take over the country. <laughs> well, we can't do that today. We send in the IMF. <laughs> but uh, it didn't solve. Uh, it, it didn't solve the problem. The countries went through a decade, a lost decade, of essentially zero growth. I was in Moldova in early, the early last few years, uh, about 2001, 2002. Moldova is a small former Soviet Union. Countries were supposed to, after they went from communism to a market economy, it was supposed to go from an inefficient system to an efficient system. And what was predicted? They would grow in an unprecedented way. Well, the only, through the, the only thing that grew in an unprecedented way was poverty. GDP in Moldova fell by 70%. And when I went there, 75% of the government's budget, which was shrunk because the country was, was had, had GDP had declined so much, 75% of the country's budget was being used to service the foreign debt. So they had almost nothing to spend on anything else. And you could see the process of de-development. You could see people going back to using horses and buggies, roads filled with potholes. And it was, it was a very dramatic uh, moment uh, for me. A very, uh, one of the people in our team had a friend that, that, whose daughter had to go to the hospital while, while we were there, was put on oxygen in the night, and in the middle of the night, the country ran out of oxygen. <coughs> and she died. And there just was no oxygen anywhere in the country. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford it. So what we take for granted, we assume we go to a hospital, we need oxygen, it will be there, this was an unaffordable luxury, and it was caused by the debt. They, they had to spend all their money abroad. How did that happen? Well, it happened because they had borrowed. At the beginning of the transition, they had no t debt at all. In 1990, they had no debt. And what happened was that in the process of transition, they had borrowed a moderate amount but it was denominated in euros, in marks at the time. But their currency was linked to the Russian ruble. Russia had a crisis in 1998. The ruble went down. And all of a sudden, the value of their debt in their own currency went up by about four to six fold. Well, what was a manageable debt became unmanageable. Again, it was the problem was they are left to bear the burden of interest rate and exchange rate fluctuations. Well, 
there are ways of solving this problem. We can to make sure it's less likely to happen, and get, that I try to describe in my book, of how we can enable markets to shift the risk to work the way they're supposed to, to shift the risks from the poor to the rich. But the other fundamental problem is the overall level of volatility, this enormous volatility in global financial markets. And that has to do with, in part, with our global reserve system. This very funny system where people hold dollars, poor countries are lending money to the United States at low interest rates. And meanwhile, borrowing from the United States at high interest rates. And it's a system that is already fraying. And again, in the book, I propose a, an alternative way, an alternative to the current uh, system, uh, uh, the dollar reserve system, a way that would actually lead to more stability, a stronger global economy, and one which was much more equitable. So before I move the formal vote of thanks to Professor Stiglitz, let me just tell you that the next lecture in the Enlightenment series will take place here on Saturday the 7th of October. It will be delivered by Professor Tom Devine, the Sir William Fraser Professor of Scottish History and Paleography, and he will speak on a puzzle from the past, why the Scottish Enlightenment happened. And the lecture will be followed by a panel discussion on the subject, could the Enlightenment happen again? And you may get tickets from the website. So now, I would really want to offer the warmest thanks. I would want to offer deep thanks to Scottish Power and to Ian Russell for initiating this and supporting this series. I would want to thank my colleagues in um, communications and marketing and in development for the organization. But most particularly, I want to thank Professor Stiglitz. That was an inspiring lecture. I think it is wonderful that somebody associated with something apparently so dry and boring <laughs> as economics could, from, to my mind, Professor Stiglitz did two things. One, he spoke in an incredibly clear and interesting way about economics itself. But more importantly than that, with our great compassion and authority, he used his analysis to address uh, really vital issues of world poverty. So thank you very much, Professor Stiglitz. Thank you.